It is that time of year when people are starting to uh, appreciate that their time as a resident is uh, coming to an end and they'll be transitioning to a next phase of life, which again, I think has different meaning in many ways, but also all those important decisions about specialty and um, where you're gonna live and all of those things are really coming uh, into uh, focus. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce um, one of our really fabulous chief residents, um, Mia Yanagasawa. I think I didn't pronounce it quite right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, she came to us, for those of you who may not remember, you know, we go, we live with one another so much for seven years on the most part, and not sure we remember all the details, but Mio was a uh, Princeton undergraduate who then went on to UT uh, Southwestern in Dallas where she was AOA before she came to join us here at UC Davis and is uh, now going on to a prestigious uh, breast surgical oncology fellowship at Emory. And she's going to talk to us this morning about um, the influence and the role of women in the uh, evolution and development of breast surgery. We're really pleased to have you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really crazy that I'm here. I feel like I've been watching chief residents do this as an intern, and every year I'm like, oh my gosh, it's almost my turn, and, and now it really is my turn. And that just means, you know, I'm closer, one step closer to graduating, which is, which is another frightening thing. Um, but here we are. So. This is my topic for today. Um, sorry, technologically. Annie, how do I get it to move? Oh, here we go. Okay, no disclosures. So this is definitely not the kind of grand rounds that I was imagining I was going to present. I was expecting to have more people, although a lot more people than I expected showed up, so thank you. Um, I guess this is more of kind of an intimate conversation, so that's, I guess, good. Um, I for one, cannot imagine that we would be faced with kind of this pandemic crisis. Um, I swear, you know, three weeks ago, March 3rd, I was in the King's Auditorium watching a game, thinking, should I really be here? But nah, it's going to be fine. California is going to be fine and, and look at where we are today. This is kind of my way of um, trying to control the situation as best as I could. So I started tracking the numbers that was reported on one of the Sacramento County websites just to see where Sacramento is doing in terms of the, the COVID case number because, um, you know, it, it's something that I've never experienced and never thought that I would experience before. Um, I have to say that, you know, I, I, am, I am ready to do whatever this hospital needs, wherever I need to be redeployed to. If it means I need to put in lines or vascular access, I'm, I'm ready for all of that. But I am still very nervous. I'm nervous about, you know, my colleagues and, um, you know, us potentially infecting patients or getting infections from patients. I'm worried that will I be a good um, chief resident and be able to protect my team from, from all of this. I worry about, you know, my children. Both of them have asthma and have needed ICU stays in the past. I worry about them. My husband, I worry about him because he, his, his you know, job stability is on the line right now. Um, so it's, it has been a very anxious time for all of us. Um, so it's a really good thing that I've had six years to prepare for this uh, talk and to think about all the topics. Um, and, and I swear, every time a chief resident would present, I would have you know, six things of topics of, okay, maybe I can talk about this for my presentation. Um, and back last fall when I was uh, making some drafts and ideas of, of what I could potentially talk about, I had um, three topics. One is obviously the one that I was, I'm going to talk about today, but I had two kind of runner-up ideas that I feel are worthy enough to talk about today. Um, it's kind of ironic that I was even thinking about those topics. So the first kind of runner-up topic is I was actually going to talk about the occupational hazards of being a surgeon. I was going to talk about how Bovi smoke, how if you smoke one gram of, of, of tissue and that smoke is equivalent to about six cigarettes is what the data currently says. And I was also going to talk about you know, sleep deprivation and how that has kind of long-term cognitive effects on people. Um, I am really glad I did not do this topic because those issues seem so trivial right now to the things that healthcare workers and we as physicians are facing. Um, so glad I'm not talking about that. Um, another topic that I was considering to talk about is this 
issue called, um, topic called the One Health Initiative, which is basically this idea where the environment and people and animals, uh, the, their healths are all intertwined together, and you cannot have the health of, of one without really understanding and promoting the health of the other two. Um, and this One Health Initiative, it also tries to look at animal parallels of um, disease processes um, and, and, and comparing between humans and animals and then how environmental factors might um, affect those health factors. Um, this topic, I, I was initially going to talk about the One Health Initiative and how it um, may pertain to cancer and cancer research, um, but the One Health Initiative would have been a great thing for me to have researched more into because um, one of the main topics that the One Health Initiative addresses is zoonotic diseases, and 75% of emerging infectious diseases are in fact zoonotic, including our, um, as many of you are aware of, our co current COVID-19. Um, presumably, they have, there are some genetic um, markers from both bats and the pangolin. And so I'm just going to briefly diverge just a little bit, just to make this talk a little bit more relevant to our current time. Um, but when we look at um, kind of the zoonotic infectious diseases, the main goal is to try to kind of understand um, animal host factors and, 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 and environmental factors and how it leads to kind of disease spillover. Um, and so there are these kind of five stages of zoonotic pathogens. Um, and some, some diseases, like rabies, it'll just, you know, just be transmitted to humans once, and that's it. Other diseases will spread not only to one human, but then to multiple humans, then potentially through communities. Um, looking specifically at the bat, for example, which gets a bad rep for a lot of infectious diseases, um, people think about, well, why, is, why do bats um, have, carry all, a lot of the viruses that um, go... Um, that go on to infect humans, and they look at, well, bats can fly, and they have this ability to um, traverse wide um, uh, range of space. Um, they also live gregariously in colonies, and they have the ability to kind of transfer viruses even amongst each other. Um, they're also um, what, what we call peridomestic, meaning they um, live in you know, roofs and barns and, and in uh, rooftops of like uh, livestock shelters. Um, and they become more and more peridomestic as um, the environment that they live in has been broken down by um, human development. And also humans eat bats for, um, for bush meat, um, which can contribute to gaining of these viruses. Um, and so, you know, these, there's this nice chart that my sister shared with me, who, who's a vet student at UC Davis, about how the stages of a pandemic goes from just the virus among animals to then maybe certain animals and just a cluster of humans, and that cluster becomes among a small community. And once that virus spreads to two countries, it becomes an imminent pandemic threat. And once the outbreak has traversed two world regions, um, it's, it's a pandemic. And so I feel like I was really debating last week when I was um, told that I'll still be having this um, presentation today. You know, should I change my topic to talk about, you know, what a pandemic is and, and how um, physicians and veterinarians and, and environmental activists and ecologists can all kind of work together to understand a pandemic? I was really debating whether or not to change my topic towards this, but I thought, you know, I'm going to stick with with what I originally was going to talk about and what I spent most of my time researching. And also, maybe we need a break. Maybe we need a breath of fresh air to talk about something different than the COVID outbreak. Um, so that's why I'm here to talk about the women's voice um, in the history of breast surgery. And, and what I mean by women's voice is um, I'm not going to give you the history of breast surgery in terms of kind of the landmark trials that have shaped breast surgery to and breast care to what it is today. I'm more going to take a different perspective and talk about um, the, the, the individual women and the kind of social and cultural movements that have shaped um, breast surgery into what it is today. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of the history of breast surgery. And specifically, I like to talk about the rise and fall of the Halstead radical mastectomy um, specifically looking and, and t talking about um, the fact that surgical change does not occur in a vacuum. Um, there's always a cultural context to it. So this is 
an ancient breast surgery. This is one of the most, um, uh, the first actually documented um, medical record, I guess, of, of observation of breast disease, and that was, you know, 2650 BC, um, this uh, Egyptian, I guess, physician uh, wrote these 48 procedures in this papyrus manuscript. And number 50, uh, 45 of that was talking about this lump that was cold and firm that he felt. And interestingly, when I was reading the translation of this, it the, the title of this was Instructions Concerning to Tumors of His Breast. Now, I don't know if that's just a a difference in the translation, but I thought it was very interesting that even in the in ancient times, you know, maybe women didn't really uh, weren't um, uh, they didn't they didn't deserve to be in such such a manuscript, and so they would find the very very rare male patients to, uh, to talk about. Um, and then we have you know the the Greco-Roman era and Hippocrates, etc. I bring up um, the physician Celsus. Um, for physician or, or medical practitioner Celsus, because he actually describes these four stages of breast cancer, which I thought was really interesting, and, and how you have early cancer and then this progression of the cancer. Um, and he recommended to not operate um, on stages two to four um, just because of this recurrence. Um, levels are high, and I thought that was very um, insightful of him um, to be able to kind of realize this. And then we go into kind of the dark ages of surgical history, really, um, mostly in the 1500s through 1700s, um, may, mostly because there was no anesthesia. So people were getting surgeries with, you know, just a little bit of, of wine or buying on a, on a um, stick or what have you. Um, and I have to say, probably the only you know, woman's voice that people were hearing were their screams at this point. Um, there were some physicians that were trying, and surgeons that were trying to make the process of a mastectomy um, as fast as possible and painless as possible by coming up with various tools to make it swift. Um, but I think it was quite a dark time for surgeons and, and patients. Um, I found this one narrative about this novelist and playwright, uh, Miss Fanny Burney. Um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1811, and she she kind of uh, because she is a novelist, she writes about what her experiences were like, and and it's just so different from from modern mo modern medicine. So I thought I wanted to share it, but um, she was upper upper class for sure. Her surgeon is actually Napoleon's surgeon. And basically, she describes her entire experience as she had no idea what she was going to go through. She was in her room, um, and, and they said, you know, drink some wine before. And then these seven men dressed in black come into her room, and um, they ask all of her maids to, to leave. And they ask her to lay in bed. And so she literally thought she was going to get raped. Um, but then they basically have her lay in bed, and they put a blanket over her face, um, but before that, she could hear, she could see them talking to each other in, in kind of sign language or, or kind of signaling with their hands what they were going to do. And so these physicians, these surgeons at the time didn't even talk to the patient beforehand what they were going to do. She could only imagine what was going to happen based on the kind of sign language that they, that they were doing. Um, so this was a horrible orde ordeal for her, but surprisingly she lived you know, 29 years um, after her mastectomy. Um, and then the 1840s come, which is the first time that anesthesia becomes available, and that really, um, this can be a whole topic in and of itself about how that kind of revolutionized surgical um, change. But in this era, um, William Halstead um, came into play, um, and obviously he's famous for, for many things. Um, he was when I was reading about him, it seems like he was a very kind of bold, charismatic um, person, very good at teaching. Um, I read some uh, stories about how he apparently did a cholecystostomy um, on his uh, on his mother on his kitchen table in, in the middle of the night, um, and then just retrieved, you know, opened up the gallbladder, retrieved some stones. Um, he gave his own blood to his uh, sister, who was under, going through hemorrhagic shock after childbirth. So he was that kind of a bold individual. Um, and he, out of the many things that he is known for, um, defined what, it's, what is now, you know, what we refer to as the radical mastectomy. Um, 
he, this is, this is not new. Um, many surgeons in both the U.S. and in Europe had kind of described this technique of a radical mastectomy, but he was kind of the first person to really um, outline step by step the procedure of how to do it, and that includes, you know, doing the wide excision of, of the skin, removing the pectoralis major minor muscles, doing the levels one through three dissection, and even he would sometimes take the dissection up and go all the way up into the neck and retrieve neck and supraclavicular nodes. Um, and his whole entire goal was to remove um, the tissue on block because he thought cancer was kind of a contiguous spread from the main center point, and then it just spread on onto the onto the muscles, et cetera. And so uh, the best outcome in terms of survival and recurrence, he thought, was to just remove as much as possible on the first go. Um, he did routinely sacrifice the long thoracic nerve and thoracodorsal uh, neurovascular bundle. Now, as you, as you can imagine, this um, was a very radical procedure and very um, disfiguring to women. Um, many women lost, you know, function, really, of, of the side of the arm, of the side that they um, were operated on. And one thing that I didn't know about the radical mastectomy was that it was actually what, what they call a one-step procedure, meaning women would be diagnosed with the cancer and then they would be put to sleep, and they would not know what was going to happen to them when during the entire procedure. Basically, the biopsy and the actual surgical procedure will be done in one step. And so if the biopsy was benign, the woman will wake up and they would still have their breast. If the biopsy was positive, obviously they would wake up looking like this, and they had, and they had no idea that this was the extent of the surgery um, that they were going to experience. Um, so I'm going to just talk about, you know, why, why did Halstead's radical mastectomy, why was, why was this the one that kind of became the most dominant form of breast cancer treatment um, back in the late 1800s and on through up until the 1960s? Um, and I think a lot of that is because he, you know, he was revolutionizing, revolutionizing um, surgical education. He was, you know, the founder of the of the surgical residency model, and he really made sure that all of his disciples kind of understood his techniques, and he dispersed his techniques widely um, all among the U.S. Um, he was also one of the big four of Johns Hopkins Hospital, um, so he had all the cred credibility and the credentials to kind of um, make this massively um, replicated across the United States. He also tracked and published um, his outcomes data. Um, so this was one of the first papers that he published in 1894, and he kind of did his own little meta-analysis meta looking at the surgical techniques of other surgeons um, in the U.S. and in Europe that had described a radical mastectomy. Um, and he says, you know, mine is better because uh, I have a 50 percent, about a 50 percent local recurrence as opposed to the other uh, surgeons that uh, cited about a 60 percent recurrence. Um, and then he published again in 1907. He kind of kept track of all the patients that he ever operated on, and he reported that he had about maybe 30 to 40 percent survival at three years, which was better than kind of the, the previously reported like 10 to 15 percent. And so in that way, he kind of had at least some sort of evidence to, to back up his surgery. Um, and then as I said, this um, mastectomy, it, it was the dominant form of, of mastectomy and breast cancer surgery that was done until the 1960s. Um, and he, he, he was really successful at, at dispersing his, his method. Um, this is a quote, though, that um, I was reading um, from one of the books that I, I read um, to kind of come up with this talk. But the author says, you know, the, the longevity of scientific and medical beliefs is not independent of the social infrastructure in which it exists. And so I'd like to go into that more and talk about the cultural climate um, of kind of the 1900s. So, so why, for example, why is it that the Halstead radical mastectomy started to decline in the 1950s, or started to decline in the 1960s and 1970s? And there's, you know, there's a specific cultural movement that correlates to that. So let's talk about the 1950s real quickly. It's, it's post-World War II. Um, during World War II, women were actually going and, and working because their, their husbands and brothers, et cetera, were, were out in the war. And so they were kind of experiencing this freedom or this totally different outlook on life, being part of the workforce and being a productive member um, of society in a different way. 
Um, but as the war ended and as kind of the anxieties of the Cold War came into play, the dominant social, societal pressure at the time was for women to stay at home, um, to be the home keeper, keeper, the caretaker, the mother of children, et cetera. And so that was kind of the, the cultural climate of the 1950s. And I think there was an underlying kind of anger and frustration in women that um, slowly um, became began to emerge in the 1960s and 1970s, as we all know, as the kind of second move of the feminist movement. Um, this woman um, I'd like to talk about, this is Therese Lasser. Um, she was the wife of a prominent um, attorney in New York, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 58, and she went to some of the best uh, surgeons at Memorial, at Memorial Sloan Ket uh, Kettering. Um, but she writes that she was really appalled by her treatment by the surgeons. Um, after her surgery, they basically did not give her any um, uh, insight or care or guidance into how she was supposed to recover. The surgeon just said, yeah, do some arm exercises, but she had no idea what that meant. Um, she, in her memoir, she talks about how she woke up from her, from her surgery wrapped up like a mummy from her torso to her neck, and she had no idea you know, what was actually done to her own body and how to take care of herself af afterwards. She had questions like, you know, how, how, how is my sexual function going, going to be after this? When can I resume intercourse? But these are questions that you know, women were not supposed to ask at that time. Um, so due to this kind of frustration with how she was treated, she ended up um, launching this program called Reach for Recovery, where she um, created this post-mastectomy support group um, to go and basically talk to um, patients after their mastectomy and talk about what to expect after surgery and how to, re how to recover. Um, and it was very interesting because a lot of surgeons actually were very hesitant and um, did not want these women to go to their patients after surgery. So they needed to get permission um, to be able to talk to, um, you know, their, their female, uh, the female patients. And so this was a really important precursor to the women's health movement, which is kind of a subset of the overall um, women's liberation and women's um, rights movement. Um, I have two pictures here. One is kind of the the first um, kind of screening programs for that developed for breast cancer. Another one is this um, kind of pamphlet called Our Bodies Ourselves, which is kind of the feminist uh, manifesto, but it talks about um, how women um, need, a, need empowering women to understand about their, their bodies and uh, the physiology of their bodies, to understand more of their sexuality. Um, it talks about you know abortion and reproductive rights as well. And one of the main um, uh, points that this book talks about is that, um, you know, before health was something that physicians and uh, people in the healthcare world had in their position that they gave out to their patients. Um, it's something that the patients would kind of earn and would receive, but this book said no, you know, your, your health is something that you can control and that you can modify. And this was, this was very empowering for women at the time. Um, so there were also kind of three very important people in the 1970s that brought up the issue about how, you know, the radical mastectomy and how women weren't really understanding what they were going to go through. And by the 1970s, you know, the, the, the modified radical mastectomy, even a simple mastectomy, these were all um, in existence. And there were especially people, surgeons in, in Europe that were already doing some trials that were looking into doing less aggressive surgery than radical mastectomy. And there was a very, very sm small minority of surgeons in the U.S. as well that was questioning the radical mastectomy. But, but women had no way of knowing this. You know, all they knew was the information that their surgeons would give them. Um, and so we have people like Shirley Temple who really um, brought out and made it public that, hey, there is something more than the radical mastectomy that you can have. Um, she actually ha underwent a simple mastectomy when she um, got her surgery done at Stanford. And um, she published in, I think, one of the, one of the women's, um, one of the uh, popular women's journals at the time, and she said, you know, the doctor make, can make the decision, but I will make the decision, and that was a very popular phrase at the time. And also in 1974, 1975, two very prominent ladies, um, the first, uh, Betty Ford and, and, Rockef uh, and Happy Rockefeller, who were the first, and, first lady and the fir 
how do you say the second lady? The wife of the vice president. Um, they were, they were um, both diagnosed with breast cancer at around the same time. And unfortunately, both of these women underwent a radical mastectomy, but they really um, highlighted their experience to the broader uh, media, to the lay people, um, about the, the importance of kind of self exams and, and going and doing your um, screening mammography. And so this really highlighted um, the the importance of how there needed to be some female figures that were very um, apparent in the broad social media to to teach women and to raise the awareness of breast cancer and how um, that's something that they actually um, that women and patients have a say in. Um, this individual, Rose Kushner, she was actually very, very important to the overall history of, of surgical management of breast cancer patients. Um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1974, and she, being a journalist and having traveled around Europe and around the U.S., already knew that the radical mastectomy was not the only option for women. So she initially refused her mastectomy, radical mastectomy, ran around to finally find a surgeon that would uh, that would provide her with a modified radical, radical mastectomy. And after that time, she, she decided that she was going to become you know, a social activist. Her job and her role in her life was to go around and be and publish not only in you know, Women's Health Journal and Lay People Journal, but also go to national conferences of the medical world. So she went to many SSO meetings and was that annoying reporter at the back of the room that would raise her hand and be like, well, have you heard about this or what about this, that? Um, in her memoir, she talks about being booed off stage multiple times as she went to um, these national conferences. Um, and what she was able to accomplish was she became so vocal that she actually be collaborated um, with Bernard Fisher. And Bernard Fisher is um, one of a very important role, uh, played a very important role in um, the evolution of uh, surgical uh, breast disease. He was the chair of the NSAABP, and he um, basically was the mind master and conducted the landmark clinical trials um, that basically took um, the radical mastectomy kind of off the table as the uh, preferred form of surgery. And he performed clinical trials that actually said, well, we don't, you don't even need the modified radical mastectomy. You can just have the total mastectomy and then get adjuvant therapies afterwards. So um, those are called the NSABP B04 and B06 trials. But um, he actually met with Rose Kushner, and Rose Kushner became um, his spokesperson to women all around the U.S., and she was actually very, very important in recruiting the members to these um, clinical trials. So Rose Kushner, she really bridged kind of social activism and medicine. Um, in 1977, she was actually designated to be the only layperson in an NIH panel to discuss about the new standards of breast cancer care. And um, people that were in the panel quote her as being the, the single most important person to end actually the process of this one-step mastectomy. So it's because of Rose Kushner that women have, that women these days in this current time can actually you know, get the biopsy first, get the results first, and then proceed with, with the surgery. Um, she was also appointed by the president to be the lay member of the National Cancer Advisory Board. So she, she was a very, very prominent figure and a very important um, activist. So um, this is just a, a chart to show how uh, the radical mastectomy fell out of favor from the early 1970s, and then by 1980s it was, you know, only 14% of all um, mastectomies were radical, and then you can kind of see the rise in the modified radical mastectomy as well, um, even a rise in the partial mastectomy over the over this decade. Um, and then this is not, I'm not going to talk about all of this in detail, but um, after, from the 1980s on, you see, you know, great um, advances being made in terms of whole breast radiation and the development of breast conserving therapy, tamoxifen. Um, you see the studies of the Herceptin, um, and, and then obviously the, the sentinel lymph node biopsy came into play by the 1990s. And so um, breast surgery has gone from something so radical to now, you know, do we need to do an axe dissection anymore? Do, we even, do patients even need to do a sentinel biopsy anymore? Um, and then you can also see that the um, breast cancer death rates also decreased um, in the, in the course of these past 30 years. Um, and so 
I like to just quickly put a plug in for people that may be considering um, breast surgery as, as their future career. But um, one of the exciting things that I think um, uh, breast surgeons um, can experience is that um, for now, for every patient, there's almost, you know, there's almost a clinical trial or multiple clinical trials that are available for each patient just because of the, the research available for a breast disease is so robust. And so you have one patient and it's almost like putting together a puzzle. You say, okay, well this patient is in this age group with this kind of cancer. I'm gonna use XYZ trials to formulate the, the, the very tailored um, patient specific plan. Um, so that's just my, my one plug for people interested in going into breast surgery. And for everyone who thinks that, um, you know, we are living in an age that is not influenced by cultural movements, um, I, I would like to remind you that even in this day and age, in this era, we are, we are um, um, not immune to the social movements of our time. Um, even in the, in the late um, 1990s and the early 2000s, there was this uh, woman that we all probably know, Angelina Jolie. Um, she... Um, she basically wrote an op-ed about her diagnosis as being a BRCA1 positive carrier, and she decided to get prophylactic bilateral mastectomies. And um, she wrote her op-ed in time. And because of this, actually, people have done research, and there's actually an increase because of the Angelina Jolie effect or because of the effect that this one very prominent celebrity talked about her breast cancer diagnosis, you see this rise in BRCA testing and this rise in um, prophylactic mastectomies. Now, whether or not that's actually in the best benefit of the patient, that's a different discussion, but it just goes to show that um, what we do today is very much guided um, by um, our, our societal um, expectations and societal cultural movements. Um, so what can we kind of do is we have to be aware of, of what the lay public, what they're talking about and um, what their understanding of their disease process is. Um, now, you know, everyone and their mother becomes an expert into a disease, especially with, you know, widespread social media and Twitter and the internet and Dr. Google, et cetera. And so what can we do? Um, I think it's that as more and more physicians um, become uh, incorporated into the social media community, that's a way that we can kind of guide the knowledge, uh, the knowledge base that, um, that uh, patients have for their disease process. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really funny because I, I actually don't, I have Facebook and that's it, but I recently opened my Twitter, I recently opened my Instagram. Dr. Raskin talked to me about opening a TikTok. Um, you know, I had no idea what TikTok was until she, she taught me what it was. But those are all the different ways that physicians these days can provide information um, to patients and kind of try to guide um, how patients make decisions for themselves. Because unlike the, you know, 1800s and 1900s, we are now living in a very patient-centered um, uh, care um, where patients make all the decisions. And so whatever way we can do to um, help give them the most correct information um, the better. So now I get to talk about my, my thank you slide, which is, which is really exciting because every chief resident gets to, gets to thank everyone. Um, so first and foremost, I'd like to obviously thank um, this UC Davis community. So I'll, I wish I had pictures of all the attendings that um, have really made an impact and helped me through these, these past six years. Um, but you know, these six years have really been a formative um, time for me. Um, to develop into, you know, the surgeon that I want to be. And also, you know, I, it's, it's been a time where I've had two children and it's taught me how to be a parent and how to, you know, also be passionate about my career. Um, so the, these six years have, have, really, have really been formative into developing, you know, who I am and what I want to be um, when I grow up. So, and obviously I really need to thank um, my my class, my intern class, I really think we have the best intern class ever. Um, we've really had just been together for these six years. Um, and it, and it's, it's interesting because the, the, the two pictures on the left are from probably intern year and second year. And then the, the most recent one is um, from Thanksgiving of this past year. And it's, and it's crazy to see how people have found, you know, people have gotten married or, or had their first child. All of that has, has gone on in the, in the past six years that we've been together. And it's really been a pleasure just to see um, everyone kind of grow. Um, and I'd like to right now take time to thank Jamie um, Anderson, who is our current um, chief 
and because I know she is undergoing such a hard job right now being the spokesperson for um, the residents and um, especially in this pandemic era so shout out shout out to, to um, Jamie um, I like to take thank my family um, my parents live in Japan and I have one sister who's a vet student at UC Davis and another sister who is an artist living in, in DC but they have been very um, I, I can't even thank them enough for the support that they've given me through the years. The lady in, in wearing the plaid dress in the middle, that's my 85-year-old grandmother, so great-grandmother to my two boys. She's actually flown from Japan, I want to say four or five times, to come live with us in Sacramento for three months, chunks of the time, just to, just to help me take care of myself. And I'm almost embarrassed that I'm relying on my 85-year-old grandmother, but, um, but she... But she <laughs> She's been phenomenal, and, and I hope she's one of those Asian women that lives until they're, they're 110. Um, and, um, oh, for people that want to know uh, why I got this crazy idea to have two kids during residency, you can thank my mother, who is a woman here in the, in the genes. Um, she is currently a, a professor in vascular biology over in the university in Scuba, but she was actually a, a physician in, in training, and she had me. Um, during her, I want to say, second year of residency. Um, so I got all, all of my ideas from her. So, um, And then lastly, I want to thank my husband, um, who, uh, I mean, I can't even describe into words how, I mean, I, I literally would not even be here today without him. Um, he... Uh, he, he's born and raised in Japan and, and did all of his, his um, training and, and college, et cetera, in Japan, but he's not the typical Japanese man that, you know, doesn't do any housework and doesn't take care of the kids. I mean, he's changed more diapers than I have. He's cooked dinner and washed the floors and cleaned the dishes more times than I ever, I ever have. And um, I, like to, I like to say that, you know, what's harder than being a surgical resident and a mother of two children is being married to one. Um, <laughs> So, and, and I don't know how many times, like, I've come home and just snapped at him because I was so stressed at work and I, I was trying so hard to maintain a happy smile at work and then I'd come home and he'd say one small little thing and I'd just explode at him and, and he'll patiently listen and be very patient. So he deserves an entire slide just to say thank you. Um, and these are my two boys. I think they're really cute. Um, so that, that's, that is my presentation. <laughs>